the 9,415 meeting of the Security Council is called to order. At the outset of this meeting, I should like on behalf of the members of the Security Council to express our profound sadness over the devastating earthquake that hit Morocco last Friday and the deadly flooding that has affected Libya over the past days. These events have led to the loss of thousands of lives. Our thoughts are with all those affected by these heartbreaking disasters. The Security Council expresses its heartfelt sympathy and condolences to the families of the victims to the people and the governments of Libya and Morocco. I now invite the members of the Council to rise and observe a minute of silence in tribute to the memory of the victims of these tragic events. Thank you. The provisional agenda for this meeting is threats to international peace and security. The agenda is adopted in accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure. I invite the representative of Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Ms. Itsumi Nakamitsu, High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, and Mr. Gheorghe Samueli, journalist. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, Distinguished members of the Security Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since my last briefing to the Security Council on this topic only uh, weeks ago, the provision of defensive military assistance to the armed forces of Ukraine has continued in the context of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine launched by the Russian Federation on 24th of February 2022 in violation of the United Nations Charter and international law. Much of the information on transfers of weapon systems and ammunition flows from governments is available through open sources. These transfers have reportedly included heavy conventional weapons such as battle tanks, armored combat vehicles, combat aircraft helicopters, large caliber artillery systems, missile systems, and uncrewed combat aerial vehicles, as well as remotely operated munitions, small arms and light weapons, and their ammunition. Over the last months, reported transfers of arms and ammunition to the Ukrainian Defense Forces have expanded. <coughs> there have also been reports of states transferring or planning to transfer weapons, such as uncrewed aerial vehicles and ammunition to the Russian armed forces, including for possible use in Ukraine. Needless to say, any transfer of weapons must take place within the applicable international legal and policy frameworks, including relevant Security Council resolutions. Any potential or suspected violations of relevant Security Council resolutions imposing sanctions or restrictive measures, if verified, are con very concerning. Reports related to the transfer and use of cluster munitions throughout the war are also very concerning. The Secretary General has repeatedly called for an immediate end to the use of cluster munitions. In line with his long-standing position, 
these weapons must be consigned to history. Most recently, in his policy brief on new agenda for peace, the Secretary General has encouraged member states to commit to reducing the human cost of weapons, including by achieving universal participation in treaties banning inhumane and indiscriminate weapons, such as the Convention on Cluster Munitions. We also take note of reports related to the transfer of depleted uranium tank ammunition to the Ukrainian forces. The supply of weapons and ammunition into any armed conflict situations raises significant concerns about the potential escalation of violence and presents significant risks of diversion and proliferation even after the conflict has ended. Measures to address the risk of diversion of weapons and ammunition to unauthorized end users and for unauthorized uses are essential for preventing further instability and insecurity in Ukraine, the region, and beyond. Such measures include enforcement of marking practices, comprehensive pre-transfer diversion risk assessments, end user certificates, including non-transfer clauses, effective legal and enforcement measures, and post-shipment verifications. To prevent the diversion of weapons, supply chains transparency and cooperation and information exchange between importing, transit, and exporting states is required, as well as concrete measures such as marking and tracing, effective accounting, and comprehensive record, record keeping practices, physical safeguarding of arms and ammunition, customs and border control measures and diversion monitoring and analysis. As I mentioned many times before, transparency in arms transfers is a crucial confidence building measure, which can serve to reduce tensions and ambiguities between member states. The UN Register of Conventional Arms, UNROCA, remains a key instrument in this regard. In its 30 years of operation, 178 member states have submitted a report to UNROCA at, at least once. I call upon member states to participate in this mechanism. UNROCA captures around 90% of our global arms flows and can help in tracking the influx of weapons in conflict zones. Moreover, the Arms Trade Treaty the Firearms Protocol, the Program of Action on Small Arms and Light Weapons, and its International Tracing Instrument are some of the arms control instruments established by states to prevent the diversion of conventional arms and regulate international arms trade. I welcome the conclusion of work of the Open-Ended Working Group, OEWG, on conventional ammunition and applaud the successful ad adoption of its final report containing the new global framework for through-life conventional ammunition management. The framework is much needed instrument to more effectively counter the diversion of conventional ammunition of all types, which continue to fuel instability, insecurity, and conflict across the world. I reiterate my call to all states to join relevant treaties and agreements and to fully implement their legal obligations under conventional arms control instruments to which they are party, as well as their political commitments to minimize the risk of diversion of arms and ammunition. Madam President, beyond addressing arms transfers, all parties to armed conflict have a duty to protect civilians in armed conflict and to ensure compliance with applicable international law, including international humanitarian law. From 24th of February 2022 to 27th of August this year, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has recorded 26,717 civilian casualties in Ukraine with 9,511 killed, 
and 17,206 injured. The actual figures are likely to be considered considerably higher. The vast majority of civilian casualties are a result of the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects, including by shelling from artillery, tanks and multiple launch rocket systems, cruise and ballistic missiles, and by airstrikes. The continued use of large numbers of armed, uh, uncrewed aerial vehicles against civilians and civilian infrastructure is concerning. Armed, uncrewed aerial vehicles must not be used in a manner inconsistent with international humanitarian law. The Secretary General has unequivocally urged all sides to avoid the use of explosive weapons in populated areas as such use is highly, highly, highly likely to result in indiscriminate harm, including in Ukraine. I take this opportunity to invite all member states to implement the political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from the humanitarian consequences arising from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, adopted in November 2022 in a broad and meaning, meaningful manner. The continued and intensified attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure and services in Ukraine, including energy infrastructure, health and educational facilities, ports, roads, bridges and grain facilities remain very much alarming. Under international humanitarian law, parties to an armed conflict are prohibited from targeting civilians and civilian objects including civilian infrastructure, and have the responsibility to take all feasible precautions in the conduct of military operations to avoid or at least minimize incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, and damage to civilian objects. The United Nations strongly condemns attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure and urges for their immediate cessation. Mines and explosive remnants of war have resulted in widespread land contamination, rendering land unusable for agriculture, while impeding the movements of people. I reiterate my call to all the relevant parties to avoid abide by their obligations under the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons and not to transfer or use any mines prohibited by its amended Protocol 2. Madam President, distinguished members of the Security Council, the past 18 months have seen death, <coughs> loss, unbearable suffering, and devastation in Ukraine. The world cannot afford for this senseless war to continue. I appeal to all member states to make every effort for peace. As the Secretary General has repeatedly emphasized, the United Nations is committed to support all meaningful efforts to bring a just and sustainable peace to Ukraine, guided by the United Nations Charter, international law, and relevant General Assembly resolutions. I thank you very much for your attention. I thank Ms. Nakamitsu for her briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. George Samueli. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this distinguished body. This is a war that could easily have been avoided. On December the 17th, 2021, Russia published two draft proposals outlining a new security architecture for Europe, one for the United States and one for NATO. The proposed framework recalled the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, in which the mutually antagonistic parties of the Cold War agreed to recognize one another's security concerns and pledged not to enhance their own security at the expense of their purported adversaries. At the heart of Russia's proposal was a commitment by NATO to no further expansion, and in particular, to no NATO membership for Ukraine. There was nothing at all unreasonable about these demands, nothing there that could not have been addressed with a little deft diplomacy. There are many countries in the world, including even in Europe, that do not join military alliances. Russia was not demanding a military alliance with Ukraine, merely requesting that its neighbor, with whom it shared a centuries-long history, not join a hostile military alliance. Neither the U.S. nor NATO deigned to respond to Russia's proposals. 
Let's recall that in its 1990 Declaration of State Sovereignty, Ukraine avowed, quote, its intention of becoming a permanently neutral state that does not participate in military blocs. Let's also recall that though NATO at its 2008 Bucharest summit had promised membership for Ukraine and Georgia, there was no desire on the part of the people of Ukraine to join NATO. A May 2009 Gallup poll showed that Ukrainians were more than twice as likely to see NATO as a threat than as a source of protection. A September 2009 Pew Research Center survey found that 51% of Ukrainians opposed NATO membership with only 28% in favor. In February 2010, Viktor Yanukovych ran for the presidency of Ukraine on a platform pledging not to join NATO or any military alliance. Following his election victory, Yanukovych submitted a bill to Ukraine's parliament barring Ukraine's membership in any military bloc. In other words, Ukraine, through the democratic process, had declared itself a militarily non-aligned state. This all changed following the illegal and violent overthrow of the elected government of Yanukovych on February the 22nd, 2014. The coup was actively supported by the United States and the European Union. This is no conspiracy theory. Just recall the leaked phone call between Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Pyatt. During the call, which took place weeks before the coup, the two U.S. officials happily discussed who would and who wouldn't be part of the post-Yanukovych regime. How did the NATO powers react to the coup? Well, the very same countries that today vent their fury at those who ousted the legally elected government of Niger exulted in the toppling of the legally elected government of Ukraine. Within two days, EU Foreign Secretary, Foreign Policy Chief Catherine Ashton was in Kiev to discuss EU support for a, quote, lasting solution to the political crisis and measures to stabilize the economic situation. A couple of days later, it was the turn of Deputy U.S. Secretary of State William Burns, who came, according to the State Department, to consult on U.S. support for Ukraine's efforts to secure a stable, democratic, inclusive, prosperous future. U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew encouraged the new leaders to begin discussions with the IMF on an assistance package. U.K. Chancellor of the Exchequer George Osborne immediately offered cash. We are ready to help. Just as soon as there is someone at the other end of the phone, we would be there with a checkbook to help the people of Ukraine rebuild their country. The European Commission announced that it was ready to conclude a trade deal with Ukraine and offer aid once a new government was formed. In reality, no one was waiting for any elections. On March the 21st, uh, of, of, uh, one month after the coup and before any elections had been held, the illegally constituted regime in Kiev and the European Union signed an EU association agreement, the very agreement that Yanukovych, in accordance with his legally defined powers, had decided to delay signing. The association agreement, one should add, had a strong security and defense component. Ukraine and the EU agreed to, quote, promote gradual convergence in the area of foreign and security policy, including the common security and defense policy. The common security and defense policy is, of course, a backdoor into NATO. President of the European Council, Herman Van Rompuy, issued a statement congratulating the people of Ukraine for taking to the streets and using violence to ensure that the association agreement was signed. Quote, the refusal to sign the association agreement with the European Union created a popular uprising, a political and cultural shift. We pay tribute to those who gave their life for freedom. And he went on without a trace of irony. The agreement recognizes the aspirations of the people of Ukraine to live in a country governed by values, by democracy and the rule of law. The most important consequence of this coup was the disenfranchisement of the people of the east and the southeast of Ukraine, Yanukovych's base of support. Much like sovereign people anywhere else in the world, they did not appreciate the violent overthrow of the leader they had voted for, and they refused to accept the legitimacy of the coup regime. Today, the United States is sending people to prison for decades for calling into question the integrity of the 2020 election. And yet the people of the Donbass was supposed to sit quietly and accept an illegal seizure of power, one that was at least in part orchestrated from abroad. Let's also not forget that as its first order of business, the coup regime, in order to demonstrate its respect for diversity and European values, scrapped 
a minority language law passed by Ukraine's parliament in 2012 that had granted regional language status, meaning that it could be used in courts, schools, and government institutions to Russian and other minority languages in any region where a minority exceeded 10% of the population. This was obviously a matter of some concern to the Russian-speaking residents of the Donbass. Not surprisingly, the disenfranchised rebelled against Ukraine's new rulers, who responded to this act of defiance with overwhelming force. NATO responded by going all in to support the rulers in Kiev as they waged a war against their own people. Just listen to the words of NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. NATO allies have supported Ukraine since 2014, he has admitted. We didn't wake up in February 2022. The Ukrainian armed forces are much better equipped, much better trained, much larger, much better commanded in 2022 than in 2014. Not least because of the support, the training, the equipment they have received for many years from the NATO allied countries. Note his words. NATO was pouring in weaponry and providing training to Ukraine's armed forces from 2014 on. What was supposed to be happening during those years? Of course, the implementation of the Minsk Accords. The Minsk Accords constituted a step-by-step -step reconciliation process signed by the Kiev government and the representatives of the breakaway regions that would have led to their reintegration into Ukraine. The key condition was to be a constitutional amendment granting the breakaway regions special status. France, Germany, and Russia served as guarantors. The UN Security Council endorsed the Minsk Accords in 2015 in Resolution 2202. We now know that neither Kiev, nor France, nor Germany took their pledges seriously. Former Ukraine President Petro Poroshenko, who signed the Minsk agreements on behalf of Ukraine, has admitted that he never had the slightest intention of fulfilling their terms. What is the uh, result of the Minsk agreement he boasted a few months ago? We win eight years to create an army. We win eight years to restore economy. Former, Chancellor Ger former German Chancellor Angela Merkel has also admitted that Minsk was never anything more than a mechanism to buy time for Ukraine. The 2014 Minsk agreement was an attempt to give Ukraine time. Merkel told the weekly Die Zeit last September, uh, it used this time to become stronger, as you can see today. And she went on, it is clear to all of us that this was a frozen conflict, that the problem had not been solved, but that is precisely what gave Ukraine valuable time. In other words, she pretended to go along with Minsk, even though she didn't believe in it for a second. Former French President Francois Hollande echoed Merkel. Since 2014, Ukraine has strengthened its military posture. He told Kiev Independent last December. Indeed, the Ukrainian army was completely different from that of 2014. It was better trained and equipped. It is the merit of the Minsk agreements to have given the Ukrainian army this opportunity. From 2014 on, the NATO powers continued to pour arms into Ukraine, pretending to be interested in implementing Minsk, while in reality encouraging Ukraine to resolve the problem of the Donbass by force. The result was some 14,000 deaths in the Donbass. Since February 2022, NATO countries have continued pouring weaponry into Ukraine. The list is mind-boggling. Shoulder-fired manpower systems, anti-ship missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, stinger missiles, tanks, armored personnel carriers, fighting, fighting vehicles, attack helicopters, howitzers, multiple launch rocket systems, high-mobility artillery rocket systems, drones, anti-tank missiles, Patriot missile systems, long-range cruise missiles, depleted uranium shells, and cluster munitions. Ukraine is now promised F-16 fighter aircraft and long-range army tactical missile systems. In addition, NATO countries, particularly the United States, have provided tactical intelligence to Ukraine, enabling it to target and kill Russians. What the NATO powers have notably failed to do is offer a convincing explanation as to what they are trying to achieve. President Biden once suggested that the goal was regime change. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the objective is to degrade Russia's military capability. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says that it's all about, quote, uh, not letting Russia run roughshod over Ukraine, something that would allegedly place the continent of Europe at military risk. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken claims that investing in Ukraine's strength paves the way for diplomacy. 
UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly claims that giving the Ukrainians the tools they need to finish the job is the swiftest path to peace. NATO Stoltenberg says the more gains Ukraine makes, the stronger their hand will be at the negotiating table. None of this makes the slightest sense. Does anyone seriously believe that as soon as Ukraine makes serious gains, the NATO powers will decide to call it a day and demand that Ukraine head towards the negotiating table? Of course not. Any Ukrainian success would immediately be touted as a reason for stepping up military deliveries. That is why today there is no diplomacy and there is no negotiating table. Former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has disclosed that he came close to reaching a peace agreement within a few days of the start of the war. As Bennett describes the agreement, Ukraine would pledge not to join NATO and Russia would abandon its goal of the so-called demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. However, according to Bennett, Western leaders, Boris Johnson in particular, blocked the deal. The pattern was to be repeated in Istanbul at the end of March. A peace agreement was in the offing, but then Boris Johnson flew to Kiev and urged Zelensky to drop the idea. Putin was a war criminal, Johnson said. He should be crushed, not negotiated with. Even if Ukraine were ready to sign a deal, Johnson told Zelensky, the NATO powers were not. Following the collapse of the talks, Turkey's foreign minister declared, quote, there are those within the NATO member states that want the war to continue and Russia to get weaker. The truth is key NATO powers want to keep the war going because Russians are dying and military contractors and their lobbyists are getting rich. U.S. politicians are at least honest about admitting this. Just listen to Senator Richard Blumenthal. We're getting our money's worth in our Ukraine investment for less than 3% of our nation's military budget. We've enabled Ukraine to degrade Russia's military strength by half, all without a single American service woman or man injured or lost. Or to Senator Mitt Romney, the money spent on Ukraine, he said, was the best national defense spending we've ever done. We're losing no lives and we're diminishing and devastating the Russian military. And of course, Senator Lindsey Graham, who famously chirped, Russians are dying, best money we've ever spent. To sum up, NATO powers embarked on a deliberately provocative policy back in 2008 when they offered NATO membership to a country that wasn't interested in it. Double down on the policy when they supported the overthrow of an elected government in 2014, then compounded their errors by pouring in weaponry for eight years, refusing to implement the Minsk Accords and ignoring Russian warnings about red lines. Now they are keeping a war going, even as casualties continue to mount and the dangers of world war and thus of nuclear conflict continue to escalate. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I thank Ms. Samueli for his briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of Russian Federation. <coughs> Madam President, we convened today's meeting, first and foremost, once again to discuss the factor of the horrendous supply by Western sponsors to its subordinates in the in Kiev of uh, different forms of weapons and the prospects for the Ukrainian crisis. And its real origin has just been explained uh, very professionally by our rapporteur, George Samuli. We would urge the council to consider this every month and each time there are new issues that warrant our discussion. Recently, Ukrainian American officials provided information that Kiev has already received from the U.S. and its allies military and other assistance to the tune of more than 100 billion U.S. dollars. And following the visit last week to Ukraine by the Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, another supply to the tune of $1 billion was made as well. The Kiev regime is just being trying to say that there's been a, uh, there's been no failure, but there has been failure in the counteroffensive. So there are uh, all sorts of shenanigans going on. Before the visit by Blinken last year, last week, the Zelensky regime, using hackneyed uh, scheme, conducted a provocation, a missile attack in Konstantinov, which was pinned immediately on Russia. So the CCTV, however, showed that the opposite was true and this upset the calculations of the Kiev pro provocateurs. 
Ultimately, we are seeing now that the Kiev regime and its sponsors are trying to dumb down this subject and not draw any attention to this act of provocation. That is how they worked after the blatant provocation and the shelling of the train station in Kramatorsk in April 2022 when the publications of witness statements of this crime uh, in social media so that it was the Ukrainian army that was at fault. In light of the failure on the front that is impossible to hide, the regime leaders are getting nervous. Recently in The Economist, Zelensky said that he was worried that support for Ukraine amongst Western electorates was decreasing. And he said it's impossible to predict how the millions of Ukrainian refugees in European countries will react to the fact that their country is being abandoned. And also the Foreign Minister Kuleba stooped to rudeness in responding to Foreign Minister of Germany, Baerbock, when she said that her country had not yet made a decision about supplying long-range Taurus missiles. He said, you will supply us with Taurus missiles. It's just a question of time. I don't understand why you're now wasting your time. We have all become accustomed to the fact that uh, Germany and Ukraine is treated with contempt and Ca uh, Councillor Scholz is disdained. This type of rudeness, however, in intergovernmental context is still rare. Once again, uh, the Borelyak also said there is money that can be made here, and that what is what he said. We will not, uh, we do not want to accept this. In fact, the UN is just a absent organization, and I would say it's a PR campaign and a lobbying campaign. Uh, uh, just who are carrying out certain activities. The emotions that the that he the, he is uh, promoting, uh, the UN is promoting, uh, the IAEA, the ICRC, ICR, uh, the Amnesty International, whatever international organisation. These are all fictitious organisations that are really um, putting nonsense in our minds. If they didn't exist, we would, I would have thought, solved many uh, problems. And this is him quoting this. So uh, you, Madam Nekomitsu, and your Director General, in his opinion, really are uh, pointless. So we can see this bankruptcy that the Kiev regime is engaging in. We can see why the Kiev regime is very worried. The Ukrainian have received unprecedented assistance, but it's not backed this up with actions. The so-called counter-offensive is now a complete fiasco. We see the equipment, including the so-called wonderful Bradley, the German Leopard tanks, and also the UK Challengers. Uh, I'd like to say, incidentally, I'd like to just say something quietly to our UK colleagues. They need to update their defence ministry site. They say that no challenger has been destroyed, but in Ukraine at least two have been destroyed and 12 are still trundling around, but they await the same fate, believe me. The same is true for the Abrams and the F-16. Many leading experts are fully warning that uh, plumping the Kiev regime with new weapons, given the current logistic and equipment problems is absolutely pointless but and uh, the western military men cannot fail to notice that so the top priority obviously is not to achieve a military defeat of russia which by definition is not possible but rather to harm it as much as possible and to pollute and harm uh, the territories that have joined our country as much as possible at the same time as the western colonizer used the burnt earth tactics in africa and asia in the same vein they placed mines and unexploded ordinances in Indo, China, Syria and Afghanistan. They're behaving in exactly the same way. Just should recall that the UK provided the UAF with depleted uranium shells and such dangerous weapons are uh, planned to be sent to Kiev from the US as well and they are preparing them along with their Abrams tanks. We see this hypocritical campaign in the West saying that depleted uranium shells are really not harmful. They will, I'm sure, say that they're um, good for your health soon. In this regard, I'd like to recall the trial in Italy of more than 7,000 military servicemen who were poisoned um, by the NATO actions in 
Yugoslavia, 400 of them died. But of course, nobody cares in the West about Serbs. And also cluster munitions that the US in large quantities is supplying to Ukraine, including into Alia because conventional um, arms uh, or conventional um, Shells are uh, decreasing in availability. And they are saying that U.S. Uh, cluster munitions are not harmful to people because they are high-tech, they're precision ones, but all the other ones are of a poor quality, and in particular because a lot of them don't explode. Of course, this runs counter to basic facts. The Human Rights Watch representatives in it, their report have said that among civilians, last year 95% of victims were caused by cluster munitions, in particular in Iraq, Laos, Le uh, Lebanon, Myanmar, Syria, and in Ukraine, and 71% of those victims are children. Most of the shelling, uh, for example, the Ukrainian army shelled Izum in 2022. The decision of the US to supply Ukraine with cluster munitions is unconscionable. In response to this, according to reports, the Biden administration is preparing a decision about supplying the Kyiv regime with long-range missiles with cluster munitions. But the U.S. Uh, investigative committee has said that uh, up to a third of these cluster munitions might not explode and they might remain in the ground as a threat for decades for civilians. And this is despite the fact that the unanimous opinion of military experts is that these munitions do not provide Ukraine with an advantage on the battlefield. Uh, they're not beneficial. So what is... Washington and London being guided by and authorizing these criminal uh, shells. Um, they clearly don't have any shred of decency left. They didn't have any indeed when they raised uh, towns to the ground in Yugoslavia, Libya, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. So I suppose why should they have a shred of decency now when they're conducting this proxy war against Russia in Ukraine to the last Ukrainian? The fact that the US uh, is backing the Kiev regime has been uh, had uh, proved by Michael Miller, the head of uh, staff, who in real time uh, using uh, satellites is monitoring the situation on the battlefield, but he didn't hide the fact that all of the intelligence gathered is hel helping them. So, in, in other words, Washington has no desire whatsoever to end this war. This war is just something that is enriching America. We've talked about that in previous meeting about the outrageous profits of Western corporations, um, most of which do not leave the territory of the US and other Western backers of the Kiev regime. Recently, there's been much testimony about the unprecedented levels of corruption here. Talking about gray areas that have been harnessed by the US to supply arms to Ukraine. I'd just like to talk to you about one more issue. Recently, the American media published information about the role of the arms trader Mark Morales, who back in 2009 was accused in the US of money laundering. Thanks to his contacts with the Pentagon and also his personal ties with the Ukrainian military command, his firm has become an important chain in supplying arms and ammunition for uh, Soviet production systems in Ukraine. As a result, Mark Morales has enriched himself to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. So a businessman is getting contracts from the US government to supply arms to another state with its backing. You can only imagine the, 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 the network of corruption here, not only in front this taking place in front of the US administration, but with its direct support. And we understand from journalists that this work started at least a year before the start of the SMO in Ukraine. We can say that the greedy, our greedy American colleagues, do they really um, want peace here? We've seen that greed runs through their very veins. According to the New York Times, in Texas, in Mesquita, there's a new factory being built for artillery shells for the Ukrainian army. It's noteworthy that when sensible voices were raised in the area about the insane supply to the Kyiv regime of arms, these people were severely criticized. Do you know why? Well, a uh, newspaper has published and this is a 
quote uh, this information. This creates p uh, jobs for people. Why would they be working against the interests of, of the people that they're supposed to represent? And this newspaper actually supports this opinion, saying efforts to arm Ukraine and Kyiv's insatiable appetite for weapons and ammunition it has prompted a defense production bonanza in the U.S. In this situation, the ugly this is not the ugly heart of the American position to support Ukraine. Um, earning money based on pain and suffering of others. Ukraine itself is continuing its totalitarian uh, dictatorship. However, it, the current Kyiv authorities are uh, basing its policy on a Nazi ideology and uh, hoisting, pe hoisting people up to the level of Hitler. We're looking at horrific corruption and as astonishing volumes of financial and material assistance being provided by the West despite this. One of the worst manifestations of this is uh, the way Q the Kiev regime treats its own people. It is uh, harming people who reject military service and the way that they uh, use Ukrainian uh, refugees as pawns, according to um, Ocha from February last year, or rather the UNHCR, 2,852 people, 1,000 people rather, left Ukraine and went to Russia. If you add to them the 3 million people inhabitants of Donbass who left after the uh, civil war that was started in 2014 by the Kiev regime, then our country has the right to say that it is one of the main hosts for Ukrainian refugees. Despite the lofty statements about assistance um, for, for Ukrainian refugees, there are no uh, guarantees for their safety. They're not protected. The most vulnerable category of people are women and children. They are are subject to abuse and exploitation. These terrible uh, factors are things that cannot be hidden. Ukrainians are also subject to um, uh, trafficking in human beings. We've seen that there's a, a black market and in uh, trading of organs as well. So uh, there is the transplant of anatomical material of persons. There is a law on this and uh, there has to be authorization from the living donor or from their relatives. But, uh, but really, the worst thing is what's happening to children. Uh, children uh, have, or, or, or the parents did not agree for their children's uh, organs to be donated after their death. For example, there was a hospital, uh, a military hospital, and this was occurring there. And, ch and private clinics are engaged in this as well. There is another law on uh, organ uh, trafficking as well. This is actively being used by criminals to uh, trade in organs on the dark net, but not just that. In 2023, on the Ukrainian-Slovak border, a person who was apparently working for an NGO was arrested, but he was engaged in trafficking Ukrainian uh, children abroad, including through organ transfers. After... Uh, it, but he was arrested, but then he was released, and now he has gone without a trace. It is clear that the Ukrainian government is covering up this bloody business. Is this something that our Western partners are going to be worried about? I highly doubt it. We should talk about the crimes committed by the Kosovan fighters with the um, connivance of the Albanian backers and the uh, connivance of the occupying NATO troops during the aggression after uh, the during the, the war in Yugoslavia. For example, there is documented evidence that from 1998 to 2000, the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, captured 300 Serbs, uh, gypsies, and n unloyal Albanians. They uh, used their organs to traffic to uh, Europe, and the so-called donors were detained 
uh, they were detained and then their organs were extracted and they were sent through the Renance airport. All of these heinous crimes were described in a uh, book by the ICTY, uh, Carla Del Ponte, a prosecutor called uh, Chase and uh, myself and military and uh, war criminals rather and also the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, Dick Marty's report dated the 7th of January 2011. Uh, confidential material was prepared on the 30th of October 2003 by UNMIC as well. The there was a delegation that went there from the ITCY and UNMIC to Burel in Albania to collect evidence. But unfortunately, in 2005, the prosecutor's office of the ICTY destroyed all of the evidence that they collected during that trip. In Albania in 2008, um, on uh, the Serbia made a proposal, or, or, or on the proposal of Serbia, uh, there was a proposal of Serbia, by the way, to, rather, to conduct a joint investigation into all of this. Uh, but unfortunately, no bodies were found, and so without a body, there's no crime. At the same time, uh, we all know that after 2000, the Kosovan uh, transplant, tran uh, organ transplants continued their criminal business in cooperation with organized crime groups uh, based at the Medics Clinic in Pristina. And the victims of these crimes were people from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So all of this was uh, something that the NATO countries didn't uh, pay any attention to. And so it is Ukrainian uh, women and girls who are really facing the most ri risk, given everything that I've said. So I would urge um, international organizations and others to pay particular attention to protecting them. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Russian Federation for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of United States. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. And thank you, High Representative Nakamitsu, for your latest briefing on this issue today. Your leadership and the continuing efforts of the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs and the global effort to counter weapons diversion remain essential. Madam President, <clears throat> this is the fifth meeting Russia has requested on this subject in six months. This latest request is yet a further signal, as though we needed it, of the depth of Russia's cynicism and willingness to waste the Security Council's time, attention, and resources. Russian officials seem to continue to think they can distract us from the Kremlin's actions undermining international peace and security, including through Russia's irresponsible nuclear rhetoric, through its ongoing efforts to unlawfully procure arms from the DPRK in violation of this very Council's resolutions, through procuring armed drones from Iran used to attack Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, and through endangering cargo vessels in the Black Sea. But Russia should disabuse itself of the illusion that we will be distracted from the darker reality we face. We won't be. We last met on this topic not even four weeks ago. Since then, Russia's daily rocket and drone attacks continue to hit Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and kill innocent people. Just recently, on September 6, a Russian missile tore through the Ukrainian city of Konstantinivka, killing 17 people. Russia's illegal inv invasion of Ukraine is the true and undeniable cause aggravating the crisis and undermining efforts to find a peaceful solution. After the United States exposed the November 2022 transfer of infantry rockets and missiles from the DPRK to Russia's Wagner Group, we have warned that Russia is actively seeking to acquire additional munitions, including through leader-level discussions from the DPRK. Security Council resolutions prohibit all UN member states from procuring arms or related materiel from the DPRK. By continuing this relationship, Russia would receive significant quantities and multiple types of munitions for the Russian military to use against Ukraine. These potential deals could also include the provision of raw materials that would assist Russia's defense industrial base. In tandem, any revenue the DPRK receives from such transfers could be channeled by Pyongyang to further develop its unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs. We will continue 
to identify, expose, and counter Russia's attempts to acquire military equipment from the DPRK or any other state that is prepared to support Russia's war against Ukraine. We urge the DPRK to cease its efforts to transfer arms to Russia. We also urge all member states to remind Russia of its Security Council obligations, remind Russia that any transfer of arms between the two countries would violate UN arms embargo on the DPRK that Russia itself has voted to adopt. Unfortunately, as we know, this is not the only time Russia has violated a Security Council resolution to procure arms. There is extensive documentation of Russia receiving hundreds of unmanned aerial vehicles from Iran for use against Ukraine, including recently downgraded information provided by the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency and shared with this Council. Such transfers are violations of Security Council Resolution 2231, and we know these weapons have been used in attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. The United States, along with other member states, have called on the Secretary General to authorize an investigation into these serious violations of Resolution 2231. We are still waiting for a substantive response to this request. Moreover, Russia has refused to allow the examination of evidence of Iranian transfers of these unmanned aerial vehicles and has instead worked to actively prevent an investigation by the Secretariat. These acts only further demonstrate Russia's continued attempts to undermine the credibility of this Council. The United States will continue to demonstrate its enduring commitment to supporting Ukraine's self-defense, including through the provision of arms and equipment that enable Ukraine to defend its territory and protect its people from Russia's unprovoked and unjustified of aggression. And let me be clear, this support for Ukraine is being carried out responsibly by helping Ukraine and neighboring states account for and safeguard arms and ammunition during transfer, in storage and when deployed, strengthening border management and security in Ukraine and neighboring states, and building the capacity of relevant government agencies to deter, detect and interdict illicit trafficking of certain weapons, we are taking concrete steps to address threats posed by the potential diversion of weapons. In fact, as we work closely with Ukraine and other partners to ensure our military assistance is properly safeguarded and used appropriately by Ukraine in its self-defense, Russia remains at this stage the only known vector of diversion of advanced conventional weapons. If Russia were concerned about reducing conflict and mitigating potential illicit weapons diversion, it would choose to end the war it started and withdraw its forces rather than escalate with nuclear rhetoric, barrages of missiles, human rights abuses and war crimes, crimes against humanity, and violation of various UN Security Council resolutions and the UN Charter. We once again renew our calls for Russia to end its war and to do so immediately. Madam President, just a few points on cluster munitions. With regard to cluster munitions, let me be clear. When used appropriately against military targets, Cluster munitions are an effective battleground tool for the defeat of dismounted infantry, including the entrenched positions, and against lightly armored mobile forces, which reflects the situation on the ground in Ukraine. Munitions across the country. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of United States. I give the floor to the representative of France. <clears throat> Madame la Présidente, Je remercie la haute représentante. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of United States. I give the floor to the representative of France. <coughs> Madame la Présidente, je remercie la haute représentante pour son exposé. Une fois de plus, en demandant la tenue d'une réunion sur les livraisons d'armes occidentales à l'Ukraine, la Russie voudrait contraire au principe de la Charte des Nations Unies. 
C'est la Russie qui a décidé de porter atteinte à l'intégrité territoriale et à la souveraineté de l'Ukraine. Cette agression et l'inégale d'annexion de territoires this ukrainiens par la Russie ont été condamnées par l'Assemblée Générale à une très large majorité. Un peu aussi qui ne tient qu'à la Russie de mettre fin à cette guerre, uh, sans préjudice à sa propre sécurité. Le fait de cesser son agression et de retirer ses troupes du territoire ukrainien, comme l'a demandé la Cour internationale de justice dès le 16 mars 2022. La Russie dénonce le soutien militaire apporté par les pays occidentaux à l'Ukraine, annonçant que l'agression est provoquée par les pays occidentaux à l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa guerre d'agression, la Russie s'est procurée des drones de combat auprès de l'Ukraine. Cependant, pour soutenir sa de ce Conseil Depuis le déclenchement de cette guerre Since par la Russie, la France a fait le choix uh, avec ses partenaires de soutenir l'Ukraine uh, dans l'exercice de son droit à la légitimité de défense et à la charte des Nations Unies. Nous fournissons à l'Ukraine de façon légale les matériels qui renforcent son appareil de défense. Uh, equipment that strengthens its uh, defense capacity, de uh, in particular transfer to Ukraine uh, air defense uh, uh, capacities that help it defend itself from indiscriminate strikes conducted by Russia against its civilian infrastructure. This military assistance has a sole goal by allowing Ukrainians to defend uh, themselves to uh, make it possible to have credible negotiations when Ukraine will decide to do so. We hope to create the conditions for a diplomatic resolution that is just and uh, lasting on the basis of international law. France will maintain its support as long as necessary, as it has uh, committed itself to do together with its partners to help the Ukrainian people preserve its sovereignty and territorial integrity. For over a year and a half, this war has caused immense suffering for the Ukrainian people and has had catastrophic repercussions for the world. Uh, for the whole world, in particular for the populations of the most vulnerable countries, in particular in terms of food security, France will continue to be engaged in favor of a just and lasting peace. This can only be based on respect for international law and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of United Kingdom. Thank you, President. And let me start by thanking High Representative Nakamitsu for her clear and expert briefing. President, this weekend a Russian missile struck a car carrying humanitarian aid workers on the road to Bakhmut, killing two and leaving others badly injured. One of many attacks on those trying to deliver essential humanitarian assistance. Newly declassified UK intelligence reveals that Russia fired multiple missiles at a Liberian flagged cargo ship in the Black Sea on the 24th of August. It is only thanks to Ukraine's air defences, which shot down the missiles, that Russia's attacks on this civilian ship failed. Russia's bombardment of Ukrainian ports and grain infrastructure has destroyed 280,000 tons of grain. That's enough to feed one million people for a whole year. In short, Russia is employing the tactics of a bankrupt aggressor that knows its military cannot win on the battlefield and instead seeks desperate ways to inflict pain on civilians and put pressure on the international community. So let's call this meeting out for the farce that it is. Russia is once again misusing this council in an attempt to obfuscate its responsibility for atrocities in Ukraine. Russia has convened this council at the same time as North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un crosses the DPRK-Russia border 
for a meeting with President Putin. There is incontrovertible evidence that Russia is negotiating potential deals for significant quantities and multiple types of munitions from the DPRK to be used against Ukraine. This epitomizes the bare-faced hypocrisy that has come to characterize Russia's conduct on the international stage. And in pursuit of these weapons, Russia will violate Security Council resolutions, including resolutions that Russia itself voted for. President, Ukraine and the whole international community wants a just and sustainable peace in line with the UN Charter, as G20 leaders reiterated over the weekend. But the only peace that is just, lasting, and compatible with the UN Charter is one that sees the full withdrawal of all Russian forces. Until then, we will continue to ensure that Ukraine has the support it needs to exercise its right to self-defense in line with international law and the UN Charter. We are proud to support Ukraine. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank Je remercie la sous-secrétaire générale Madam Izumi Nakamitsu pour son exposé édifiant. Et j'ai écouté avec attention l'exposé de M. Samuel Lee. Madame la Présidente, la préoccupation qui nous réunit ce matin se fait récurrente dans l'agenda du Conseil de sécurité. Les livraisons d'armes continuent de prendre de l'ampleur et de nouvelles alliances militaires sont annoncées. En plus, les risques d'escalade de violence dans une guerre qui a déjà fait de milliers de victimes civiles innocentes et un nombre incalculable de destructions d'infrastructures nous sommes profondément préoccupés par l'intensification des hostilités, alors que de nombreuses voix à travers le monde appellent à la désescalade, à la cessation des combats et à privilégier le dialogue en vue d'une solution durable au conflit. Il va de soi. Plus d'armes aux belligérants équivaut à plus de morts et de destruction, et sans doute plus de risques de prolifération et d'insécurité à moyen terme dans l'ensemble de la région et au-delà. Le réarmement massif des belligérants de la guerre en Ukraine contribue à mettre à mal les efforts considérables consentis par la communauté internationale en faveur des armements de la non-prolifération des armes de tout genre. L'augmentation des flux d'armes dans la région, que ce soit pour des raisons offensives ou de contre-offensives, emporte manifestement le risque d'aggraver la situation parce que les situations peu contrôlées d'armes et munitions nous ferons sans doute qu'alimenter la belligérance et rendre encore plus difficile la recherche d'une solution négociée. Bien entendu, les premières victimes seront encore et toujours des civils innocents. Madame la Présidente, As always, will be innocent civilians. Madam President, it is an illusion by either side to strive for, for peace by banking on a military victory. The acquisition of new stockpiles of weapons will further shatter peace and prolong the conflict with the most serious humanitarian consequences. I'd like to take this opportunity to underscore and recall our common engagement, which epitomizes the very spirit of the UN Charter, that is, to protect the people of the world from the scourge of war. By stating this, I reiterate the opposition of my country to war. We continue to be convinced that the most effective way to limit the circulation of weapons is to put an end to the war. To continue this conflict is to condemn the region to a long-term insecurity. The belligerents must step up their efforts to prevent the risk of diversion of conventional weapons by using regional instruments and mechanisms and international ones that exist 
existe en particular the arms trade treaty and the international trade we call on all parties to put faith in dialogue and to commit to good faith negotiations in order to silence weapons and to lay the groundwork for a lasting peace and peaceful coexistence. Thank you. I thank the representative of Gabon for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of United Arab Emirates. Madam President, I thank the High Representative Nakamitsu for her informative briefing. And I welcome Ukraine's participation in today's meeting. All member states of the United Nations have the right of self-defense and to manage their national security and defense system in line with the UN Charter. It is also vital that risks associated with the transfer, storage, and deployment of weapons are carefully managed. As we have seen in other contexts, the threats of weapons ending up in the hands of terrorist groups and other malign actors, which may target civilians and negatively impact security and stability, is significant. Preventing the diversion of weapons to such groups is of particular consequence. Given the interconnected nature of such challenges, it is critical that the competent national authorities protect against the risk of weapons diversion and that international actors cooperate as appropriate to bolster these efforts. This Council has recognized the need to address such risks in different situations around the world, including in December with the adoption of Presidential Statements 2022-7 condemning the flow of weapons, military equipment, unmanned aerial systems, and improvised explosive device components to terrorist groups. Last year, seated the Counterterrorism Center of UNOCT and UNIDIR released the technical guidelines to facilitate the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2370 of 2017 and related international standards and good practices on preventing terrorists from acquiring weapons. The technical guidelines provide practical tools that can support the development and implementation of national policies and facilitate international coordination. We encourage all member states to consult it as appropriate. Madam President, the most effective way to mitigate the risks associated with weapons transfer during wartime it is to end the war. We therefore repeat our call for de-escalation and dialogue. The diplomatic path towards peace remains fraught but is the only path that offers hope in bringing about a just and sustainable end to this devastating conflict in line with the UN Charter. The UAE stands ready to support all genuine efforts to that end, and I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of United Arab Emirates for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ecuador. Señora Presidente, Madam. Agradezco la exposición informativa de la alta representante para asuntos de desarme, Izumi Nakamitsu. Reitero una vez más la posición del Ecuador de rechazo a la violencia armada, la militarización y el armamentismo. Lamento una vez más que la invasión prolongada contra Ucrania continúe exacerbando el gasto militar global que en 2022 ya sobrepasaba los 2 millones de dólares. Sobre nuestra preocupación por los problemas para la paz, we la are seguridad y la estabilidad peace, que supone la corriente entrada de armas y municiones a gran escala uh, is, uh, en cualquier situación uh, de conflicto reiteramos nuestro llamado a que se observen uh, e incrementen los estándares so like re de evacuación, like registro y trazabilidad uh, de armas y armas standards of mark, marking, registering, and traceability for arms and Cualquier munitions are maintained and further made stricter. 
Any uh, transfer should of weapons should be accompanied by measures aimed at avoiding diversion, uh, continuation or escalation of conflict. Furthermore, uh, these efforts uh, should also focus on post-conflict recovery. Any delivery of weapons or munitions should also be subject to guarantees of respect for the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precaution when these weapons are used. For this reason, we cannot support either the transfer or the use of cluster munitions. Señora Presidente, Madam President, una potencia de ocupación, an occupying como power, lo es en este caso la Federación de Rusia, in this case is the no Russian Federation, cannot país expect that an invaded no country does not defend no its population or defend its territory. Lo contrario significa una múltiple the contrary would mean a, a, a complete de las refutation of the United Primero, Nations Charter. Del artículo the first paragraph of Article 2.4 los miembros de la organización en sus relaciones internacionales in their international se abstendrán de recurrir a la amenaza o al uso de la fuerza the contra la integridad territorial o la independencia política de cualquier estado o en cualquier forma incompatible con los propósitos de las Naciones Unidas. Segundo, del artículo 51 uh, por el cual ninguna disposición de la Carta menoscaba el derecho inmanente de legítima defensa, individual o colectivo, en caso de ataque armado contra un miembro de las Naciones Unidas. Tercero, porque en San Francisco, los pueblos de las Naciones Unidas resolvimos preservar a las generaciones venideras el flagelo de la guerra, con tal fin practicar la tolerancia y convivir To, uh, practice tolerance and enemies. coexist in peace as good neighbors. Hoy se sigue infligiendo Today, ese flagelo a las generaciones actuales ucranianas y rusas con incalculables consecuencias globales. Global Por esa razón, uh, le insistimos reason, a la Federación de Rusia que detenga definitivamente su agresión militar neocolonial para silenciar las armas y dar paso a una solución pacífica and enmarcadas to, en el respeto uh, a los principios de la Uh, based on Muchas respect gracias. for the principles of the United Nations Charter. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ecuador for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Malta. Thank you, President. I thank High Representative Nakamitsu for her informative briefing and have taken note of Mrs. Hamoudi's statement. It is regrettable that the Russian Federation has once again called for a meeting to discuss the transfer of weapons from the West to Ukraine. This meeting, which is turning into a recurring one, is solely intended to push Russia's narrative to depict the aggressor as the victim and the victim as the aggressor. It is nothing more than a blatant attempt by the Russian Federation to justify the unjustifiable. It goes without saying that this alternative version of events conveniently leaves out the fact that on 24th February 2022, the Russian Federation chose to violate the fundamental principles of international law that binds us all and proceeded to launch an unprovoked war of aggression against its sovereign neighbor. These actions are even more serious and worrying when we consider Russia's role and responsibility as a permanent member of this Council that is entrusted with the maintenance of international peace and security. President, our response also remains unchanged. We once again strongly condemn Russia's senseless and illegitimate war against Ukraine. We reiterate our full support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. Equally, we underline Ukraine's right to self-defense as enshrined in Article 51 of the UN Charter. Russia's continued escalation through the use of missile and drone attacks all over Ukraine has killed and wounded more than 410 civilians over the past two weeks alone and damaged civilian infrastructure. The recent missile attack perpetrated by Russia on a market area in Konstantineska in the Donetsk region is the latest shocking development in a long string of atrocities since the unprovoked war of aggression. 
this is unacceptable. According to the High Commissioner for Human Rights, since February 2022, there have been at least 6,717 civilian casualties in Ukraine. These are mostly a result of the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects, including shelling from artillery, tanks, multiple launch rocket systems, cruise and ballistic missiles, and air strikes. Malta echoes the Secretary General's call to avoid the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. They cause indiscriminate harm and immense suffering. We stress once again that civilians and civilian infrastructure are not a target and urge Russia to cease these, att cease these attacks. Attacks against civilians constitute war crimes. All efforts will be made for perpetrators to be held accountable. These reprehensible actions are the real obstacle to peace. Malta appeals once again for constructive dialogue and diplomacy to establish lasting peace, stability and security. In closing, President, we urge the Russian Federation to end its hostilities and withdraw its military forces and proxies from the entire internationally recognized territory of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank the representative of Malta for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Japan. Thank you, Madam President. I thank USG Nakamitsu and other briefers for their briefings. It is noteworthy that we are convened by Russia on the same topic yet again in so short a span of time. Throughout this period, member states who are committed to upholding the principles of the UN Charter have continued to support Ukraine, exercising the right of self-defense to ensure its sovereignty and territorial integrity in, in accordance with the Charter and international law. At the same time, we observe a flagrant violation of the UN Charter by Russia, which perpetuates its aggressions without relenting. The, the intensified cooperation by some member states with Russia that enables this behavior should not be overlooked. We must not lose sight of the overall picture. It is also troubling that Russia's attempts to repeatedly convene the Security Council on Ukraine just for reciprocating are squandering the Council's valuable resources. Russia should use its rich diplomatic experience and influence to foster peace and stability rather than undermining it. The path forward is unequivocal. Russia should withdraw all its troops and military equipment from Ukraine and focus its diplomatic prowess for genuine, on genuine constructive efforts that uphold international law and principles enshrined in the UN Charter. I thank you. Thank the representative of Japan for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. I thank you, Madam President. At the outset, I wish to thank USG Nakamitsu for her informative briefing. I also thank the civil society briefer, Mr. Samweli, for sharing his views. Madam President, Ghana continues to be deeply concerned about the sustained aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine and its implication for international peace and security. We reiterate the continuing commitment of Ghana to the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, and reaffirm Ukraine's inherent right to self-defense afforded by the rules of international law and the Charter of the United Nations. As the Council addresses once more the subject of the supply of weapons to Ukraine, our view is that there is no alternative to winning the peace in Ukraine. We continue to be minded by the growing numbers of civilian casualties and the risk associated to the and the risk occasioned to international peace and security by the proliferation of arms. Nothing is normal about the prevailing security and humanitarian situations in Ukraine as ordinary and innocent citizens continue to pay the price of the war with their lives and livelihood. 
We reiterate our calls on all sides to endeavor to uphold the obligations imposed by international humanitarian law for the protection of civilian lives during war and the preservation of life-supporting infrastructure. We also re-emphasize the necessity for strict compliance by all concerned states with their obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty and other international agreements to safeguard against the diversion or illicit transfer of conventional weapons to unintended recipients. Madam President, Ghana believes strongly in seeking an immediate end to the intensifying military contestation and we believe that this must occupy the attention of the Council and the international community while efforts are also made to facilitate constructive dialogue between the warring parties. As we have stated in our previous statement in the Council, the security interests and concerns of the parties can best be addressed through peaceful means and not the barrel of the gun. We therefore encourage the drawing of lessons from past UN mediated conflicts to support a peaceful, comprehensive and lasting resolution of the conflict between the Russian Federation and its neighboring country, Ukraine. In closing, we call once more on the Russian Federation to immediately and unconditionally withdraw its troops from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine to accord with the rules of international law and the core values of the Charter of the United Nations. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I thank the President Nakamitsu and Mr. Samuari for their briefings, and I welcome the representative of Ukraine to this meeting. Our position has not changed since our previous meeting on this issue last month. Brazil fully recognizes and upholds the right of all states to self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Without prejudice to such right, we believe that the increasing flow of weapons to any conflict will not help its solution and bring lasting peace. In particular, the introduction of increasingly more destructive weapons feeds the spiral armament and makes peace even more elusive with consequences well beyond the battlefield. An additional factor of instability brought by the transfer of weapons and ammunition to conflict zones is the constant risk of diversion to non-state actors, including criminals and terrorist groups. Brazil urges all member states to adhere to the arms trade treaty and other instruments to prevent diversion. Madam President, all states must abide by the responsibility under international humanitarian law. We reiterate our call for all parties to honor and respect international humanitarian law and the fundamental principles distinguishing combatants from civilians. There should be no acceptable collateral damage when the stakes are the well-being of civilians. We strongly urge the parties to prevent harm to residential areas, energy and transport infrastructure and port facilities. Nuclear civil installations are of particular concern and should be carefully protected against any harm. The only truly effective manner to protect civilians and vital infrastructure and economic activity is to end the war. Only a political solution that takes into account the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and the legitimate security concerns of all parties will bring lasting peace. Brazil renews once again its call for the discalation of hostilities and for the establishment of negotiations either directly or through the other peaceful means described in Article 33 of the UN Charter, which have brought justice and lasting solutions to so many other conflicts. Thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Madam President, I thank the other representative for the affairs of disarmament, Madam Izumi Nakamitsu, for her intervention. Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, for her speech, I have taken note of Mr. Samueli's comments. More than 500 days have passed since the start of Russia's military aggression against Ukraine, and the suffering and damage inflicted continues to worsen. Switzerland strongly condemns the attacks perpetrated by Russia, which target civilians and 
and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine or affect them disproportionately. They are destroying lives and livelihoods, forcing people to leave their homes and generating growing humanitarian needs. Access to essential services, including education, is also affected. Only a third of children in Ukraine can receive a full education in person. In addition, attacks on ports and grain infrastructure continue. Coupled with Russia's decision not to pursue the Black Sea Initiative, these attacks are affecting global food security. The contamination of agricultural land by mines and other explosive devices only exacerbates the difficulties encountered encountered in exporting products from Ukraine. La Suisse réitère sa consternation face aux effets de la guerre sur la population civile en Ukraine et au-delà. Ils représentent une conséquence directe de l'agression militaire de la Russie au mépris flagrant de la souveraineté et de l'intégrité territoriale de l'Ukraine et en violation de la charte des Nations Unies. Nous rejetons toute tentative de justifier cet acte ou de détourner la responsabilité de ses conséquences. Nous réitérons notre appel à la Russie à entamer to de the situation immediately, cease all hostilities de combat, and withdraw its troops from Ukrainian territory without Ukraine. delay. Nous rappelons également que l'Ukraine, comme tous les États, a le droit de se défendre, de défendre son intégrité territoriale et d'assurer sa sécurité. Le droit international humanitaire doit être strictement respecté. Les parties au conflit ont l'obligation de veiller constamment dans la conduite des opérations militaires à épargner la population et les infrastructures civiles face à la crise nouvelle des deux volontaires humanitaires tués et de deux autres blessés dans la région de Donetsk ce week-end. Je rappelle qu'ils sont eux aussi protégés par le droit international humanitaire. Cette incidence ajoute à plus d'une centaine d'autres qui ont déjà entravé les opérations de l'État. Les actions humanitaires sont particulièrement difficiles à mettre en œuvre dans les territoires sous contrôle militaire de la Russie. Il est fort inquiétant que l'Est de l'Ukraine soit devenu de plus en plus dangereux pour les travailleurs humanitaires. La Suisse réaffirme sa solidarité avec les Ukrainiens et les Ukrainiens. En redoublant les efforts humanitaires et de consolidation de la paix, nous plaçons leurs besoins et leurs exigences au centre. We promote an inclusive and participatory reconstruction process. And we support justice for all victims and the fight 